So welcome everyone to the Wards 1 and 8 uh, Neighborhood Planning Assembly or NPA meeting. Uh, I'm Cindy Cook and I'll be trying to keep us on, on track and on schedule and I'd like to just have people introduce themselves. So can you take it away, Liv? And we'll get back to you, Jonathan. Hi everyone, my name is Liv Pena. I live in Ward 1 and I'm also a member of uh, the steering committee for this group. Um, also wanted to share that uh, Councillor Roof will be attending tonight, but he said he is coming from work, so might be a little bit late. Hi, I'm Carol Livingston. I'm also on the steering committee um, and I live in Ward 1. I'm Keith Pillsbury. I live in University, I live on University Terrace and I'm the Ward 8 School Commissioner. I'm Angie Chapel Sokol. I live on North Prospect Street, and I have no official position. Hi, I'm Karen Long. I am on the steering committee. Hi, good evening. Um, this is not, can people hear now? It doesn't sound like it's working, does no, it? No, it doesn't. This, well, because this one, you know, go across the room, so. Okay. Let's, let's try <laughs> this one's working. Hi, good evening. I'm Sharon Busher. I'm city councilor for Ward 1, and I live on East Avenue. Hi, I'm Jack Hansen. I'm the East District City Councilor. I live on Pearl Street. Hi, I'm Holly Shaner McCray. I live on Mansfield Ave. Glenn McCray, Mansfield Ave. Uh, Bill Church, Ward 1, Bradley Street. Uh, he lives in Ward 8. I'm Ann Brenya, Ward 8. <laughs> and I live with him. We're in the same ward. <laughs> Tom Derenthal, Nash Place. Pat Seelan, I'm on Nash Place, which is in the old East End. And I'm Dave Colley. I'm uh, uh, also Ward 1 and an active member of the Old East End Neighborhood Coalition. Hi, I'm Lisa Kingsbury. I'm with UVM Planning, Design, and Construction. I'm Tom Heyer with Bittison Heyer, uh, <coughs> excuse me, working with UVM on the housing master plan. Hi, Joe Spidell from UVM and Community Relations. Uh, Gail Champnoy, uh, UVM Office of Student and Community Relations. Martha Lang, Colchester Avenue, Ward 1. Hi, Pitt Kill, Money Van with Cito. Jonathan Chapel Sokol, Ward 1 Steering Committee. Richard, Richard Hilliard, uh, Ward 1 High Growth Court. Michael Long, Ward 1. Hannah King, Ward 8, and I'm a Steering Committee member. Grace Pacito, Ward 8. Laura Wheelock with DPW. Thanks for coming. So welcome everyone. Oh, and last but definitely not least, Cyril. Cyril, <coughs> Ward 1. Thanks. Okay, so uh, let me just run through the agenda really quickly. We're going to have, we did the introductions, we're gonna speak out, which is a chance to make announcements and, um, and speak to any issues that you want others to be aware of. <laughs> like the problems with the sound uh, I think I, that was my fault. Was it? Okay. Yeah. So, um, we've got some, some, uh, some committees to talk about populating. Then we're gonna do the, uh, uh, we're going to have a conversation about the UVM housing study, uh, uh, updates from the, our legislators, discussion with DPW about uh, East Avenue safety and sidewalk uh, issues that we talked about several months ago, and our city councilors are going to speak. So I'm going to try to keep things on schedule, but also uh, make sure that we have a chance to, to discuss stuff. So it's, it's a challenge, and uh, um, I'd appreciate your help with that. So. Let's start with Jonathan. Could you speak to the uh, um, the representative to the Colchester and East Avenue um, committee, and also to the uh, community development block grant stuff? Sure. Okay. Um, should I take this one? Yeah. 
Good evening again. Um, let me start with the uh, Colchester Amps uh, study project and I'm going to read you essentially what was a note from Nicole Loesch on this, on this, um, this study. She writes, as many of you know, we have been working with the neighborhood for improvements along Colchester Avenue. Our next project is scoping, or a planning study, for safety and mobility along the corridor with particular focus on the East Ave intersection, bike accommodations, and parking options. We'd like to invite Ward 1 to, to appoint one representative and one alternate to participate in the advisory committee for this study. Yeah, and then if possible, did, could we do it by last month? But she sent this earlier, so in fairness to her. Uh, the study will pick, kick off with a public meeting in the first week of December, so that happened, and many of you were there, I think. Soon afterwards, we'll hold our first advisory committee meeting. For those of you who have participated in scoping studies before, the sequence is reversed from our typical meeting schedule. We're planning to hold the public meeting before the advisory committee meeting so that we can solicit concerns of the public, summarize the issues for you, and have a detailed um, first meeting. Of course, everyone's welcome to participate in all the meetings. Um, advisory committee will, commitment will be for three committee meetings over the course of the study, which is through the spring. So it'll be three, three meetings over the spring, and that uh, committee members should solicit feedback from their constituencies. So it would be great for whoever wants to be on the committee, they come back to this meeting and maybe during the public forum and speak out, talk about a little bit about what they've learned since the last meeting and what they might like to know from us. So that's the, uh, that's the uh, Colchester F scoping uh, study. Let's go ahead and, and get, uh, uh, yeah. So uh, I think that you were suggesting that we try to find a representative today, tonight. Because and it's, already, cause it's the, already going on, so we want to make sure that at the, at the first committee meeting there's, we're populated. So is anybody here interested in serving on that committee? Yeah, could you speak to that just briefly? Your name and it's which? Song. It should Hello? be. Is that, uh, I will talk loud. Perfect. <clears throat> Uh, I'm Dave Cauley. I live on Nash Place. Can you use the mic even though you don't, may not be able to hear it? Okay. I live on Nash Place, and uh, I did go to the meeting last Monday, a week ago Monday, that, uh, you know, was, was or Wednesday, I think it was, for this uh, committee. Uh, I'm excited about this project because I've lived in the neighborhood for uh, 28 years. I've seen some of the improvements on Colchester Avenue, and there's still more to be done. In fact, there were, we spent about an hour and a half talking about the safety issues that still occur, you know, up and down Colchester Avenue. Um, my background is that I have some engineering in my background. I worked at uh, Vermont Energy Investment Corporation for uh, 30 years, and in that capacity, we did a lot of work with uh, engineering studies, uh, technical potential of energy efficiency, that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm familiar with doing technical studies. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited to uh, you know, participate in this committee. Uh, I can spend time and love to report back to this group on uh, activities and get ideas and input about what else we could be doing to help uh, the neighborhood, so. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Are other people interested in being considered for this committee? No, so are you ready to close nominations and, and vote? Okay, so all in favor of? Maybe we should have a nomination. What's that? And I think you're supposed to have a, a second. Didn't it say like two people or no? Yeah, a, a potential alternate. Oh, yeah, so we're looking for an alternate as well. Start with a member and then an alternate. Okay. Okay, okay so are, there are no other uh, candidates here. So um, all in favor of, of Dave as, as, a, uh, uh, as our representative for Ward 1. So this is a vote of Ward 1, folks. Any opposed? Okay, so congratulations, Dave. So is anybody interested in serving as an alternate? Richard, great. Could you say a few words, Richard? Uh, uh, very, very quickly, I've participated on the, uh, as a uh, Ward 1 representative on about three or four of these advisory committees. It was a very, very good meeting last Wednesday. Uh, Dave will be a great nominee for um, for our representative uh, and if he needs an alternate I will be glad to fill the bill. Thanks Richard. Any uh, other interested parties? 
So is it the pleasure of the Ward 1 folks here tonight to have Richard be the, the alternate? I'm seeing nods, so I'm going to um, yeah. not go with Richard's rules here because I don't think we need them. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we're going to move on to the uh, Community Development Block Grant and back to, to Jonathan. All right, I just have a very little bit to, to read about this, and I can describe it. I, I'm the previous um, representative from Ward 1 on the advisory committee, so I can tell you a little bit about it, or you can ask me questions. Uh, but I'll read this. This is off the CEDO page on the Community Development Block Grant, and I'm going to say it one more time, and then, then I'm just going to use the initials. Community Development Block Grant, CDBG, and that's what you'll hear everybody saying it is. The Federal Community Development Block Grant, or CDBG, program is a principal revenue source for local communities to address the roots and consequences of poverty. The U.S. Dep Department of Housing and Urban Development administers the program on a national basis and awards grants annually to entitlement communities, including Burlington, on a formula basis. The city, in turn, awards grants to local organizations, as well as operates several CDBG-funded programs. Uh, so in a nutshell, what happens is that is that the federal uh, the federal government gives money for housing and they give it in the form of block grants. And in the state of Vermont, there are there are two block grants. One goes to Burlington and one goes to everybody else. Um, so we're actually really lucky about this. I mean, it, it, the reason for it is that we have a lot of problems, but there are other communities that do too. But um, but Burlington gets to decide how that block grant is is spent, and one of the wonderful one of the many wonderful things about Burlington is that Burlington has Burlington has instituted an advisory committee to decide how that money is spent, and so citizens get to sit and make a decision about how the block grant money from HUD is distributed in the community, and that's rare, Sharon. Right? I mean, this may be the uh, one of the only places in the country that does this. Um, and and the, well, the, the way the process works is that, is that folks apply for grant money uh, and there's really two different kinds of money that are given. There is, um, there is public service money and that's, that's really what it sounds like. So these would be, uh, it, it might be um, uh, not necessarily ongoing costs to an agency, but something that the agency does uh, to provide service to the community. Um, so some examples that have that have come in the past are things like um, the organizations that provide free tax writing services to the, to the public, and they may want funding for that. Um, there's very little money that goes to public service. All, uh, most of the money goes to the other half, which is development. And that's the real point of the HUD money. The real crux of the HUD money is to, is to build affordable housing, to uh, remove blight uh, in a community. Um, and so most of the money goes in that direction. Uh, and those projects are projects you've, you, you've probably seen all over the place. The Old North End redevelopment, the, um, the, the St. Joseph's, that was funded with CDBG money. Um, it was supported with CBG, CDBG money. There's plenty of money from other places too. Um, the affordable housing and the senior housing over in Cambrian Rise is being supported with CDBG money right now. Um, and so those are the kinds of big projects and that's where most of the money really ends up. Uh, but, the, but what happens is that a group of people, there's somebody from every ward, and then there are mayor, mayoral appointees, and um, Jane Helmstetter from the state is on the committee, and there may be one or two others. Um, and uh, and this, the committee scores the applications, and a lot of the scoring has to do with whether the applications are properly filled out, to be honest. It's a kind of a pathetic thing, but uh, very often the applications are poorly done. Uh, the committee scores the applications, and then the committee discusses how to, how to distribute the money. Um, and there's generally a discussion whether you distribute the money, uh, kind of spread it out like peanut butter, or whether you just say a couple of these programs really don't uh, reach some level of merit to get money, and then that makes it more possible to, to fund others. Whatever it is, and however the committee works it out, those recommendations go to the, to the city council and to the mayor, and they uh, and they um, they get implemented. Uh, so it's a it's a really interesting uh, process. It's a great committee to be on because you learn a lot about 
the services and programs that are going on in the city. And Sharon, it looks like you have something to say. I, I, yeah, I did, because you, you touched upon something. This is one committee where really the citizens are empowered. Uh, for a while, the citizen advisory group existed, but then those recommendations went to the mayor, who could tinker with them, and then the council could further tinker with them. And so that really took away the enthusiasm from the advisory, citizen advisory group, because they felt that their input was being devalued. And so I don't know how many years ago there was a decision made that if we, we we feel like the citizens of this community really know what the needs are. And therefore, if we, may, if we created this advisory group, we should respect their recommendations and not alter them. And so that has been the practice before. So it's really important um, that people understand this is empowering and, and important. And it's not easy because there's so much need and so little money. Um, it's, shrunk, it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And so I just want to just speak to the process and the value that everybody that agrees to represent us will have in this process. So thank you. Thanks, Sharon. And it is, and it was a, it was a fantastic, it really was a fantastic experience. I would recommend it to anybody who's vaguely interested. It's uh, a meeting a month from January to April, and the April meeting is typically not necessary. Um, and there's free food, and you get to meet people from across the city, other other people from the, every all the different wards, uh, and it's um, it's great. Tom, how big is the budget? How much money are you? Oh, about? Um, the, like the $10 no, $10 no 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 the CDBG the HUD money is uh, it's a hundred to one hundred fifty thousand dollars for public service, and it's maybe three times that for. Um, for development, it's half a million dollars or so. It kind of depends because uh, CEDO takes a certain fraction of it for projects that CEDO is working on. And so it's not the same every year. But it's something like 100, it was last year maybe it was 100 and a quarter for public service and it was three or 400,000 for, um, for development, so it's half a million dollars. And you typically get a million dollars or more in requests. So generally, there's twice as, many, twice as much request as there is money to, to serve. So there's real decisions to make. Okay, so, so we're telling you about this now because in, uh, at our January meeting, we're going to be electing representatives for, for both wards one and eight. And we just wanted you here, the folks that are watching on uh, the television, to be aware of this. And if you're interested, uh, please let us know. Uh, at the January meeting, we'll be voting on, on uh, reps for wards one and one ward, in ward eight. And I'm sorry I'm taking so much time, but it just um, if you're in ward eight and you want to learn a little bit more about it, I'm happy to talk about it, but Gabrielle Seeley was the rep the last two years, so you could talk to Gabrielle about it too. Okay, so one last thing, and then we'll have you uh, give you an opportunity to make announcements. Uh, we've been, we, the steering committee for the NPA, have been talking about uh, how we might use the, the budget, because with this year we now have, have uh, nice funding. Thank you, city councilors, for, for making that uh, possible. And uh, we're looking at a number of uh, possibilities. And somebody who's been more involved in the, those conversations, I would love to have you speak to it briefly of the, the things that we're thinking about. Um, Karen, can you? Hi, some of, well, one is the monthly uh, food. We're bringing, you know, more appetizer, you know, finger food stuff. Um, we started with more like just grocery store crackers and cheese the last two times we've splurred. City Market did an amazing job, so please help yourself with um, sushi and these little pinwheel wraps. So that's part of the money. Um, we've talked about both Ward 1 and Ward 8 want to do some kind of like an event, like a block party, neighborhood type thing. Um, We've also talked about, well, we've talked about mics, but I think we can work that out with Cyril, because this is really nice. Sometimes we can't hear each other, and this one's working really good. It's not screaming. Um, what were some of the other things? I can add to that. OK. The so one other thing that we talked about is uh, the way that we advertise our meetings, and uh, I think one of our most one of our most major ways is front porch forum. So one thing that we discussed was a donation to them because it 
I don't know what we would do without Front Porch Forum. Okay. So if people have thoughts, ideas, uh, recommendations as to ha ha how we use this money, we'd appreciate that. This is just a, a quick conversation now, uh, but we're going to be, uh, as a steering committee, uh, putting something together and bringing it back to you in the next month or two. Just, just a quick question. What about live streaming? I know we've talked about that before, and is that going to happen citywide, or does that have to come out of the individual NPA budgets? Uh, it we it may or may not cost us anything. The the medical center, which has been gracious enough to provide this this space uh, gratis over the years, uh, is looking into it. And there's some security issues, and uh, they're they have a couple of things that they need to resolve. And I'm not really clear what those are, but they they're aware that we would love to live stream so that fo folks like you that are watching us now could can be actively engaged uh, in the moment in real time. So just in the interest of ensuring that we're allocating this money or ultimately would be allocating this money in the essence of its intent, can you please explain to us the um, criteria that was defined to the dissemination of the funds? I'm just tr trying to understand what qualified us to receive this money. What are the conditions under which a, uh, a community is receiving this money? Yeah, great question, and and we we haven't we don't have a budget yet. We're I mean, just. I mean, from the federal government. Ah, uh, um, can federal. what's that? It's it's city, it's city money. It's this city is money? yeah. This is it's city council money. It's it's the city council um, had a discussion based on the uh, the all the ward steering committee saying that um, the budget the initial the existing budget was was really so minuscule that really no one could do anything with it all you didn't have enough dollars to provide any kind of um, amenities um, or expand um, the number of people so no, no this is not the block grant this is the NPA okay so sorry this is the NPA budget that they were talking about yeah, and um, if you could have a conversation with with uh, Jonathan about that offline, that would be great. I think I was late on that conversation. Yeah, I think yeah, we 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 switched gears, and uh, so we were talking about the NPA budget. Um, so each NPA has twenty five hundred dollars a year, and uh, so we're going to shift now t to brief announcements, and I th think Keith has something. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that everybody is aware that the uh, the Bur Burlington High School Construction Project Oversight Committee meets uh, regularly on a monthly well. They, uh, they meet weekly, but then they have a regular uh, monthly update at Burlington High School on the third Thursday, which is next Thursday, the 19th of December, from 5.30 to 7. That is where all the information, that, what's going on with, with, the, with the architects and the uh, construction people have been working on, and we, they report out to this oversight committee. Thanks, Keith. Other announcements? Yeah. I can try this. Yeah, it's working. Yeah, and, and speak up because it doesn't ma it doesn't uh, amplify in the room. Um, as most of you are aware, India House has closed, and as a neighborhood, we are trying to figure out well what we can attract to go in there that would satisfy a lot of us. So uh, we've developed. Dave and I have developed a survey on uh, that we posted on Front Porch Forum. It'll be open until December 20th, so please go to Front Porch Forum. It is December 10th, issues 2575, to find the link to the survey. You can. It takes five minutes to say, "What do you want? Do you want a restaurant? Do you want a cafe? Do you want a gymnasium? What would you like?" And then Dave's going to compile all of that and report back via Front Porch Forum and to our neighborhood, to our meeting. Great. Thanks for doing that. And could you say your name so that folks in the, uh, on TV can know who to contact if, they, if they're not active online? My name is Patricia Seelan, S-E-E-L-A-N. Thank you, Patricia. Thank yeah. you. Are there other announcements? OK, great. Uh, uh, Carol, yeah. <coughs> um, AARP is running a, um, 
a candidate forum on February 12th, which is a Wednesday, um, and our um, city council candidates uh, for our wards will be um, presenting their viewpoints. That falls on the same Wednesday that we normally meet. Um, so our steering committee will um, figure out what to do, but we've looked to see if we can change it. That's not possible, and we really want to support um, this event and this work. So we really wanted to have you all know right now that this is happening. It's February 12th, um, which is a Wednesday. Uh, it's at the YMCA. Um, not sure what time, um, but we will post something on Front Porch Forum and really urge you uh, to go. 7 6 to 7.30. 6 to 7.30. Okay. Thanks, Carol. Yeah, Mark. Uh, maybe I got uh, this. Maybe I'll get this one on time. So I just wanted to alert you to the um, the exhibit that's at the Fletcher Free Library right now. Uh, it's the 1619 uh, exhibit that came in from Hampton, Virginia. And just a little bit about it: the the Racial Justice Alliance, uh, in conjunction with the folks over at Fletcher, uh, brought the exhibit in. Um, the, the exhibit itself is going to be there until uh, the end of the day on Sunday. So there's a closing uh, commemoration ceremony. Uh, the first um, Africans traveling exhibit, the, the, the true narrative about the history of uh, Africans in the United States enables us to better understand who we are as a nation. Uh, it's only through this understanding that we're able to set right our path and build hope and promise for a collective future for our children. So you can check out, um, check this out. Just go over to 400 H. Um, 400 YAAHCVT, that's 400 Year African American History C Consul or Commission, Vermont. 400 YAAHCVT.com slash support if you want to get behind that. Uh, and also just give me a shout if you want to get some more information. You can uh, find me at info at justiceforallvt.org or else 532-3030, uh, 532-3030. Thanks. Great. And you're going to leave some of those at the, the, the front table? I'm taking them all with me. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Just to clarify, this is for this Sunday, is that right? This is through this Sunday. Through this through Sunday through is the exhibit. At the close of the 15th, it is gone back to, to Virginia. We'll be packing her out, okay? It's there okay. now. Thanks. So next up is Lisa Kingsbury and, uh, whoop, nope. Could I yeah, uh, sure. give the link for the survey monkey? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So the link for the survey monkey is W. And this is about the India House, right? This is yeah. about the India House survey. We've already had over 50 responses. Yeah, it's great. It's really cool. Uh, it's www.surveymonkey.com front slash capital N, capital F, 9X6J9. December 10th issue. Great. Thanks. Okay, so next up, the folks from uh, UVM, Lisa Kingsbury and Tom Heil, is that? Yeah, um, we're gonna speak to the housing study that they've done, so welcome. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lisa Kingsbury and, oh, sorry. I'm not sure where it should be. No, that may have been me again. I, okay. I think I brushed the, okay. so there may be kind of Thanks, Sarah. Okay. Over here? Is this better? Yes? Okay, sorry about that. Um, so I'm Lisa Kingsbury, I'm with UVM Planning, Design, and Construction. Um, I'm just going to give a brief introduction and turn it over to our consultant, Tom Heyer. Um, Tom is a consultant out of, based out of Washington, D.C. He does a lot of work nationally and he did our housing master plan in 2015. I was here a couple of months ago talking about the work he had done then and some of the changes that we've had on campus and um, in terms of our uh, housing for graduate students um, and the reasons that we brought Tom back to do an update. So we're here tonight to talk to you about Tom's findings on the research in terms of what undergraduate students, um, specifically juniors and seniors and graduate and medical students are interested in in terms of more housing. Um, um, we've also, we met with CEDO this afternoon, and then after the winter break, Tom will be coming back. We want to give him a chance to also talk to the undergraduate students and talk to the graduate students and medical students, 
talked to our neighbors in Ward 6, um, and I understand the council may be interested in us coming to do a presentation there as well. So we're trying to get out, have Tom um, give his findings to give the community a time and students a time to kind of respond back to some of the issues, um, and we'll keep this going as a process and keep the community informed as we move forward. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to be here this evening. Um, what I'd like to do is to review for you uh, the, some of the work that we've been doing. Um, we actually, uh, some of you may know, we did the original housing master plan around uh, 2015 for the university. And uh, because of some things that had changed, the university had asked us to come back and do some updates. Uh, first of all, you may be aware that central campus was rebuilt, the old housing was torn down, and new housing for first year students was, was built. Um, they've also implemented learning communities, which is a slightly different programmatic approach to on-campus uh, residential life than was uh, in existence at the time of the, that we did the original master plan. Um, and then also the sale of Fort Ethan Allen, uh, which had been a graduate uh, housing area, um, had obviously eliminated a lot of housing for graduate students. So um, the charge for us was to update the master plan and particularly to update our housing demand analyses um, for, at the, for both the undergraduate and the graduate populations. Um, we did a series of student focus groups and we also did a survey of students to uh, get their viewpoints on housing, on, on interest in living on campus, off campus, et cetera. Uh, we also updated our local market information so that we could have a good sense of what was going on in the local market in terms of rents. Um, and then we did do demand analyses and we focused those on juniors and seniors and the graduate and medical populations. Freshmen and sophomores are required to live on campus so there was no need to do a demand analysis for them. So we'll start with juniors and seniors. And um, one of the things we explored with them is, you know, what was their preference in terms of where they like to live, on campus or off campus. And we posed some very specific questions. And one of the questions was specifically, you know, what's your preference for living on or off? Uh, the big red part of the pie there, 71% of the respondents, uh, the, 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 res the response that was checked was, my preference is to move off campus as soon as I am no longer required to live on campus. I would not consider living on campus as a junior or senior under any circumstances. So there's a very large part of the population that really does not have a lot of interest in living in, on campus. And this is very consistent with what we see nationally. Um, typically for a state institution, they will house their first year students. Some will house some portion of their second year, their sophomore students. And then as people, as, as students become juniors and seniors, then more and more they live off campus. Do you have a question? Yes, I, I see that you have some of the criteria that was probably the basis of that of that 71%, but I'm wondering how, how, how much uh, cost is a factor? Did we'll you explore that? Okay. We'll get to that, Great. yes. Um, so, so that was part of, that was one part of the response. Uh, the gray part of the pie there, which is 8%, uh, was my preference is to remain on campus during junior year, but to move off campus in senior year. And then the blue part is 21%, and the, the response there was, I would be interested in living on campus throughout my UVM undergraduate experience if housing were available to my liking. And that's an important element, because we'll talk about what juniors and seniors are looking for by way of housing. And as we actually have listed some of the things here, um, their actual interest is, is in living primarily in area, the area between the campus and downtown. Uh, they're looking for more independence, space, and privacy than campus housing. And that really just goes to the type of housing, you know, wanting to live in an apartment versus a residence hall, wanting to have more freedom from the meal plan and some of the housing and RA policies and things like that. Very typical and very natural for students as they get older and they get developmentally more independent. Um, seeking a more home-like environment, same sort of thing. Uh, wanting to cook and, and not have to necessarily deal with the meal plan on campus. So we also asked, you know, what are the things that we might be able to do to, you know, attract you back to campus housing? What things uh, could in increase the appeal of living on campus? Um, they did say make housing more affordable. Um, students perceive that the off-campus housing 
is going to be less costly, and in some cases it is, is particularly if they you know, live several students to a unit and they can drive the cost down that way. But as we'll talk about in just a moment, the perception and the reality aren't necessarily the same. And I believe actually based on what we've heard from students and from the survey work, that cost is just one factor, but the bigger factors really really relate to this notion of um, as, I, as a junior or senior, I really want to be in a more, in, more dependent, thank you, more independent living situation. Um, it's, it, the, the, the culture is to actually move off campus. Um, and again, the attraction is to be near campus but also near downtown because that's where their social life is. They're also looking, it, 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 if there were more singles or more apartment style housing, uh, that would also be a, uh, an attractor. Um, and they're looking for, even under campus housing, a more independent living situation. And uh, a good example of this is Redstone Lofts, which is on university property, but it's managed independently uh, by a third party. And it has much fewer rules, um, and many fewer regulations than, than campus housing. And that's attractive to some part of the population, but I think geography is the biggest issue, wanting to be near downtown and near campus, not squarely on campus or not tucked away in the rear portion of campus where Redstone Lofts is. So we did actually ask a lot about cost and we did some, a lot of exploration of on versus off campus. And while there are certainly, there are examples of on campus housing that are cheaper than off and there are examples of off campus housing that are cheaper than on campus. But one of the things that we tried to do was to create at least somewhat of an apples to apples comparison of what, it, what a true cost would be. So these are just a couple of examples and the title there says average all in annual cost of selected on and off campus units. I need to clarify right up front that when we talk about the annual cost for the on campus housing we're talking about a nine month cost because that's what is available on campus. And for the off campus housing we're talking about a 12 month cost because most of the leases that exist off campus are 12 month leases. And so if you are a student who's only going to be here for nine months um, and you're living off campus, your option is really either to sublet over the summer or to pay your rent over the summer if you can't sublet. And students tell us that there's not a robust subletting market here. So there can be, uh, you, you can actually end up paying that full amount. So one comparison is a university suite, double occupancy versus a local market, three bedroom apartment. Double occupancy means there are two people in a bedroom. Now that's not ideal for a junior or senior, but some people are willing to do that uh, to save some money. And if you're willing to do that, the cost between a suite on campus and the local market three bedroom off campus is of just a couple hundred dollars. I should also say that by making this all in, what we've done is we've also added in uh, things like utilities off campus because those are significant. We've added in some transportation costs for some students. We've added in food both on campus meal plan and off campus. We've, we've surveyed students a lot both here and elsewhere over the years and you know, have some sense of what students pay you know, on a monthly basis for food if they're living off campus. So we've tried to put a bunch of factors in um, and, uh, and internet because they pay for that off campus. Yes. So do I have it right that, that these numbers compare a uh, double occupancy uh, UVM suite with a three bedroom um, so I'm wondering why you're, why you're doing that, because well, it's, it's not it, apples to apples. That's well, it's, a, it's the closest that we can get to, because the, the double occupancy would probably be two bedrooms that are four students, and the three bedroom apartment, we are told, even though you know, the, the students are, will probably put four people, they'll use the living room as a bedroom. Mm -hmm. So you, you'll have your own individual bedroom, um, but, you would, but there would be four people in that unit, or there might be a couple of people sharing. It's, it's not, we're not saying that it's an exact comparison, we're just trying to indicate that when students say it's much more expensive to live on campus, it's not necessarily, when you add in all the factors, it's not necessarily the case. If you look at the bottom example where it really is more comparable, the single occupancy university suite, meaning you have your own bedroom, versus a two bedroom apartment in the local market, there's about four or five hundred diff uh, dollars difference annually. So that's not a huge difference um, if you think about it. So I think the main point to take from this is Cost is an issue for students, but it is not the primary issue that, uh, that incentivizes students to go off campus. 
Uh, we also did a demand study. Uh, we looked at, uh, we asked the students based on all the questions about what's your level of interest in campus housing. Um, and so we projected demand. And this, what we're showing here are numbers that are over and above what the university is now housing uh, in terms of juniors and seniors. So the university has juniors and seniors in their campus housing and in their affiliated housing. And they have about, I think, 450 or so juniors and 300 or so, 350 seniors. So these numbers are above those. This is the additional demand. And if you look at it in, uh, in percentages, which is the bottom line there, these numbers are very consistent with what we see nationally, about 20% percent of soft, uh, excuse me, juniors and about between 10 and 15 percent of seniors typically will live on campus and the rest are living off campus. Um, and that's just, a, that's just a matter of, of, again, the preference for having a more independent living arrangement and the fact that most, most universities only provide enough housing to house their first year students and some of their second, yes? So in, in those the, numbers, yeah. So in those numbers, do you factor in that some of those students who are juniors and seniors are RAs? Uh, these numbers, uh, we've taken out the RAs because they're living in other units. So these are, these are pure demand other than RAs. Okay. Yes? On, on the transportation costs... Can, can you grab a mic somewhere? Yeah, Sharon. When you said you factored in some transportation costs, right. I was curious if that's just, you know, bus fare or were you considering car ownership and, you know, costs because they have to drive everywhere and parking, which is kind of what we see it's in the neighborhood. Primarily, our, primarily we've considered things like uh, bus, bus passes and, and uh, that kind of transportation. Um, I can't, I can't quite recall if we've got a parking fee in there for the university, but we're trying, we were trying to, a lot of students actually walk, so there's not a lot of transportation cost in there. Yes, sir. So, so maybe you'll get to this, but do you consider at all the strategic, the demand in the city for housing, or is it just simply focused on campus? Because as 30% of the population, 25% of the population, what you guys do on campus impacts housing in the rest of the city to the point of how do we hire employees when they can't afford to live here and they and um, there's more housing than just what happens on campus and yet you seem to do it in a vacuum well uh, let me respond to that by saying that our, our study the, the charge of the study was to determine what is the demand for housing off campus and on campus um, and I think I think the, the, the reality is, because uh, we've been doing this now for four or five years here, and I know what the issues are in, that you know, people are very concerned about what is happening in the neighborhoods, and I, I totally understand that. And we talked, in, in, in th through the various meetings that we've had over the years, we've talked with a lot of neighbors, and I've heard very directly the impact that students have on the neighborhood. But even the economic development of the city requires proper housing. Right. My, my point, I think, is that you, no institution that I know of that is a state institution will require a junior or a senior to live on campus. They are going to go off campus. And I think the, the, the key question to me is, if they're going to be living off campus, how do you make, how do you minimize the negative impacts of students living off campus, and how do you maximize the positive impacts of them living off campus? I, I think that to say that we have to get all these students on campus isn't going to be a reality because they're just not going to do that. So the question is, is there a way to make this work where students are on, in the community and the, the negative impacts are minimized? And I think that's the, the big question that, that has to be addressed. It's just not behavioral. I understand that. Yeah. So do you have another slide similar to this that shows what the demand for off-campus housing, the change, changes in uh, the demand for off-campus housing are? Because this, this shows the increase in demand for on-campus, right? Right. This, 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 the, the obverse of this is just that everybody else would be off-campus. Yeah, but it would be great to have the numbers for that, of we can, number of number of bodies. And, and okay. Um, so just to summarize for juniors and seniors, the issues are 
Um, there's a strong preference for living in a location between UVM and downtown Burlington. And if you look at the, the map there, one of the things that we did in the survey was we asked them, where do you currently live? And we said, give us your, the, the two intersections closest to your house. So we weren't asking their specific house, but roughly where they live. And we mapped that, and as you can see, there's a high concentration between the university and Church Street. The larger the circle, the heavier the concentration. And I think the red is fourth year and the blue is third year. So you can kind of see those populations. So there's a lot, <clears throat> that's, that's, that's really a lot of where they're focused. There are a few outliers. We didn't, we cut those off the map just so that we could make this more re readable. But the primary populations are in this area. Um, and so they're really, as I say, they're looking for independent living. They're looking for a location between the university and downtown. Um, and in a way, um, I think those are the most important things. Who owns the housing isn't necessarily as important if the rules and regulations and all of that mirror an independent living style that they're looking for. So now we'll move to the graduate medical housing, medical students rather. Um, let me say a word about them just generally from a national perspective because we do work all across the country and we've done a lot of work with graduate students and medical students and their interest in housing. The thing about graduate students is <clears throat> they, many of them are on a stipend um, and particularly at UVM when we talk to them, a lot of students had no other income other than a stipend and so they have to really be able to afford their housing based on that stipend. They also require more square feet per student than undergrads. Whereas you can put four undergraduate students in a suite style housing arrangement and it's very efficient because you've got four bedrooms to the common space and to the bathrooms and so forth. Graduate students tend to want to live more like real adults with maybe two, two people sharing an apartment, each having their own bedroom. So there's roughly more square footage per student, which means your costs are higher, but they have less money. So it's very difficult to make graduate student housing work economically. Most of the places that I have worked, graduate students typically live in the oldest housing that has all its debt service paid off, very little cost, not very nice, but it is what they have and it's what they can afford. So it's a hard proposition to make work. Um, they prefer not to live with or near undergraduate students in part because they're really different than undergraduate students, in part because they're teaching undergraduate students and they don't want to live among the students they're teaching. Um, Geographic proximity is not as critical for these folks as it is for, for undergrads. Uh, so they don't mind some of them traveling as long as there's good transportation. Having said that, they also don't mind being close to campus. Um, and some are seeking transitional housing. If you are, you have to sort of think about the graduate population as several populations. There are the PhD students who are here for four or five years. They typically want housing in their first year and then after that they're fine going off into the community and finding their own housing. If you're a master's student, you're only gonna be here a year or two, very likely that you'll wanna live in university housing for both years because it's just easier that way or maybe one year and then you move off. If you're a medical student, because of the nature of a medical program, uh, your first couple of years you're in school but the second two years you're in clerkships and you're going back and forth to the hospital, different hours of the day and night and students really don't wanna have housing be an issue for them so they're perfectly content to live in, uh, in a housing situation where they can be there for several years, many of them. Um, the existing conditions, they are spread out among several neighborhoods. Although they do live downtown, there's also a population in Old North End uh, in Burlington. Some are living in Winooski, particularly families. Uh, some in South Burlington. And then there are others that are, again, outliers beyond here. Um, and uh, most of the students told us they are living in condominiums or apartments under, uh, for dra the graduate students and medical students. What are the housing issues for these populations? Well, even before you get to the issue of demand, these students are looking for better information about housing and about Burlington. Some of these students uh, come to Burlington and not only may this be their first time in Vermont, this may be their first time in this country and they show up on day one and they may not have a place to live. Um, so they're, they're looking for information on how do I get housing, where do I go shopping, where can I get groceries, just all kinds of things. And some places provide this information better than others. The medical school does a pretty good job of that. It's a very solid community. The graduate populations are more balkanized because you may have just a couple graduate students in any given program, so there's not necessarily a formal way of helping these students find housing. They also have time challenges in that they, the undergraduates have selected all of their housing before the graduate students even know they're coming. So they are coming to the game late. 
Um, international students have even more difficult issues, uh, particularly as we make immigration and coming to this country more difficult. They don't have social security numbers, they can't get leases, so there, there are a lot of issues that uh, international students have with housing. Um, and finally, they're looking for ways to create community. The nice thing about Ethan Allen, Fort Ethan Allen, was that it was a real graduate community. All the students living together, uh, it helped with things like childcare, people could switch off taking care of each other's children, uh, but it was also people together in the same circumstance. And uh, so, um, so they're looking for, to kind of replace that. Um, their interest is in some ha having some on-campus, ha our campus housing, university-affiliated housing. Two-thirds of the graduate and half the medical students said they were interested in university housing at UVM. 90% said their primary interest is in first year, uh, either definitely or strongly considering that. 49% in later years. Preference for apartment style with individual bed bedrooms. Locations we tested, one between campus and downtown, another Trinity, that's another attractive area, particularly for the med students because it's right across from the medical center. Uh, and then we looked at some other places as well. Spinner Place, they don't mind the location, they don't like the configuration of that. Possibly Quarry Hill, but there would be transportation requirements. This is the demand that we project, uh, about 500 beds overall. That would raise uh, the percentage housed from about 5% to about 40%. Um, and there is, a, as you can see, a pretty strong demand here among graduate students. And so finally, just to wrap up, the key issues, there's an interest in housing options on or near campus. Yes? Can you go back to the other, oops, sorry. Can you go back to that other slide? I just wanted to get the numbers for so, graduate and medical. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's okay. 340. I can't see. It's uh, graduate is 347, okay. medical's 156, total is 503, Thank and you. then the percentages um, would be uh, for graduate going from 5% to 39%, medical going from 4% to 37%, and total would be 5% to 38%. Thank you. Okay. And so finally, as I say, uh, just to sa sum up, uh, their interest is in housing options on or near campus, that the options have to be affordable, and they're also looking for better information in the local market. Yes, did somebody have a question? No. I can, I'll put them all together after you. Okay, so I, this is, I'm, I'm done now, so if you have questions, please feel free. And um, I'm going to open up, but since I have the microphone, I'm going to ask you one, which is uh, if you could turn those numbers around, because you're interest, you, you, the university is interested in the demand on campus. Right. We're interested in the demand off campus. So if you could give us those numbers sometime in the next month or so, would, is that possible? That would, seems like it's a simple exercise, and it would be really helpful to, to take a look at, at that. Lisa? I can tell you right now that, <clears throat> excuse me, we have, for undergraduate students, um, we have about 10,500 students right now, and we house a little over 6,000 of them, and about 3,000 of them live in the city of Burlington. Okay. So. So, so, but it would be great to get the, the hard numbers and the change from, um, you know, from last year to this year and, and projections yeah, sure. going forward. I usually bring those in the phone. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Okay, so I think, that, Jack, did you have something? Yeah, I had a couple. So the graduate student figures, it said going from 5% to 30-something percent. But the slide before it said 90% of the first year grad students wanted it and 49% of second year yeah. grad students Yeah, uh, the, the way we do it, the survey asks, um, what's your level of interest? And, you know, we, and some, part of that 90 is definitely interested and part of it is, is uh, strongly consider. And we weight those responses based on what, definitely, if you say you're definitely interested, we weight that at 100%. If you say you're strongly consider, you would strongly consider it, we weight it at like 50%. Um, and also you're looking at um, the, uh, you're looking at all populations together. So there's a strong interest in first year. It falls off after first year. So, um, so the 90% is only for for the first year, and that's uh, and that is even weighted. And then it was it was 49% for second year. Right? 49 percent for second year and on. And again, that's weighted. Um, the 49% is again split between definitely and strongly consider. Strongly. So we weight those as well. And so um, that's how we end up with those numbers. And we ended up at 30 something percent from that. Yes, because some uh, because there are um, because it, we're looking at the total population and um, the 
the weighting cuts out a, a lot of the of of that. The, the the we don't even consider the bottom part of that where we say I might consider it, I won't consider it at all. Okay, that to me is. I, I don't we can go back and I mean the numbers. I, uh, I'm confident of the numbers. Um, we can uh, we can. The weighting to me just seems strange because strongly considering is pretty strong, and then might might consider well, is still possible. The other the other thing the other thing that I should mention is that when we do this, there's a there's a direct percentage, and then there's a confidence interval, and we do it at a 95 percent confidence interval, which means there's a low, a medium, and a high range, and we always take the low range because we like to be conservative, which is why that number is much lower than what, you're, what you would expect to see, because we like to be conservative in our demand estimates, because it's easier to build more than it is to build too much and have vacancies. Got it. I had a, I had a few more, but did you want to say something right on that? Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, and then in terms of the cost breakdown on and off campus, yeah. what were the different components of that? like? Is that broken out in the report in a way that we can look at? Um, what what we do is we have the uh, the basic cost of um, let's take on campus first. We have the cost of the actual housing. We then add the cost of a specific type of meal plan, and depending on the population, the meal plan might differ. And then we add to that. Um, I, let's see if there, I don't think there would be any other costs for on campus. Um, we might, I, I can't remember if we add parking or not, if we, we're assuming that students have to pay for parking. But that's one piece of the puzzle. For off campus, we will, what we've done is we do a survey of all, a bunch of units in the off campus market. And we categorize them by studio, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, whatever. Um, and we also, I think, list them by houses and apartments. And we compute averages. So if we've, if we've surveyed 30 one bedroom units, we'll take the average of that. And then once we got the average of all the different uh, unit types, then we add in things like additional food cost, additional transportation cost, utility cost, whatever we're adding in to normalize it. And we are, we, can we see that breakdown is what I'm wondering, to understand like what portion of that total is housing versus food and transportation and yeah, non-housing sure. expenses? Sure. Yes. OK, OK. And then. Within that, you mentioned something about sharing a room off campus or something. But this, when you when you showed the numbers of that slide of the comparison, I don't know if you could pull it up, but the seventeen thousand as the cost. I just want to be clear: is this this is someone who has their own bedroom, right? Like a two-bedroom apartment. The bottom one and the bottom one, we're comparing a two-bedroom apartment to a single occupancy, so in both cases, they would have their own bedroom. Right, and, but in the top one, you're talking about. The top about one, it's, we don't know, we, I mean, w w you could look at it one way and say, you have a suite with two people in it, you're sharing a room, versus you have three people in a uh, three bedroom apartment that are three individuals, but it could also be based on what we heard by students, from students, it could be four people, it could actually be five people. I mean, there's no way of, of I mean, there's no way of exactly getting a comparison because the units are very different. Well, what we're just trying to show is that the numbers are a lot closer on and off than I think students perceive. We're not saying that it's specifically $100 or $500. We're saying that it's not, the difference is not $3,000. It's, it's a much closer number than, than students think. Right, no, I just want to highlight that though because when you do share a bedroom downtown and you're comparing up top sharing a bedroom with a three bedroom, usually with downtown you're not sharing a bedroom, but if you are, the cost drops significantly mm -hmm. from that. So that's what I wanted to highlight, there's a big, discrepancy there. Um, all right, well, I'll follow up. I look forward to getting like the more detailed report and following up. So I just want to clarify on those numbers because there seems to be a fair amount of interest in it. Are you talking the 15,000 for the p three bedroom? Is that for the full three bedrooms and it's divided by three? No, it's, 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 in, it's per person. It's all per of these person. are per person. OK, thank you. So um, I, I want to focus on the 21% who may consider if housing was available to their liking. Mm -hmm. Because what you're hearing from 
this group of people is that the competition for off-campus housing is fierce and that we don't have enough housing and it's not affordable and part of it is because of the competition um, and the low vacancy rate. So I'd like to understand better how you are targeting that 21% um, to try to figure out how, and you've talked about location, but I haven't really heard anything definitive about what you're going to do. The graduate and the medical students are a different story, and I would really like, not tonight, but I would really like when you come back to understand why UVM let go of Ethan Allen. Um, that the housing at Ethan Allen because people really love that and it was a community and I think you know um, I, I just didn't I never understood that I never understood why that was let go but I don't know how many of those people that are graduate students I'm not sure how many stay in the community like buy a house and stay in the community and so they're they're part of the fabric they're not transitional they're just really part of the fabric uh, and our, our homeowners I just really don't know those numbers mm -hmm. um, so um, I understand the the numbers that you stated for graduates and medical students and you know it to me I when I talked to Joe Spidell earlier, you know, it seemed to me that Trinity Campus was a perfect place for medical students. I mean, you roll out of bed and you're at the hospital. Right, I right. live on East Avenue, I worked at the hospital, I rolled out of bed and I was at the hospital. It's very convenient. <laughs> um, no transportation needed except right. your feet, you know. So anyway, so, um, uh, so that seems to be a match as far as I'm concerned, using medical student jargon here right. um, but uh, um, as far as graduate students also I think that looks like um, a viable option but it still doesn't deal with that 21 percent who are moving off campus who you might be able to attract on campus if it was housing that was more to their liking um, let me answer that now uh, so I think that the um, when we say more to their liking, I think that still does include the idea of it being geographically in between the university and downtown. Um, I think that's the population you need to try to capture. Um, that they, most of their, uh, their life consists of going to, going to school and then socializing downtown. And so even when you talk to the people at Redstone Lofts, even though they like the freedom and the sort of lesser management there, one of the complaints they have there is location because it is so remote from downtown. So I think that if you are, and I'm speaking personally here just based on my knowledge of what I learned from these students, I think that if you're, your, your hope, your best hope of, of addressing the problem is to find ways to create housing between the campus and downtown. So, that, so then I'm going to ask you to rethink that slide that you present because I think it's misleading and I don't think that's your intent, but it said 71% want off. 21% right. may consider if the housing availability available is to their liking and 8% would live on campus through their junior year but would move off. I wrote those numbers right. down. So to me the 21% is misleading if you really don't. Living between the campus and downtown still means that you're going to either have to create housing in a space that could go for other types of housing not just student housing or it is meaning that um, you um, Anyways, I, I just feel like that's not solving the housing problem, really. Um, we can, well, we so, uh, I'm going to so ask, it. Anyways, ask us to move on because we have two other people that want to have questions or comments and then we're going to move on to the next thing. And I understand that there's a lot of, of interest in this and uh, the steering committee is, is working on having a full evening about uh, housing and UVM issues. So, so uh, apologies that we need to cut this somewhat short, but go ahead, Karen, and then so the gentleman in the back. On the, in the purple, the 17,400 is for a university student that has, a, that's their price, not yes. two together. No, that's their price. Okay, 
So I do think you are drastically off with the local market for a two-bedroom apartment because in new construction, I've heard people pay up to one thousand right. a month for their. But wait a second. So that would be twelve thousand for them. But other, it's more like around seven to eight fifty per bedroom, which is more like under ten thousand. So seventeen thousand nine hundred for one person is, you know, in my opinion, way off. Well, we'll go back and look at the numbers, uh, but I'm pretty confident we've, we've scrubbed these numbers a lot. Um, the when you add in other costs to it, those are the things that raise the cost. Um, we'll go back and check the numbers, uh, so and let you know if we have any updates to them. Yeah, That'd be great. Um, thanks. It was this gentleman. Uh, uh, hang on a second, Liv. There's uh, yeah in the back, and then then uh, Liv. I just want to make sure that I'm understanding your take-home message here is that you're not looking at any off-campus possibilities to build housing for juniors and seniors, but you are looking at some off-campus possibilities for graduate and medical students? I, I want to be clear that we're not looking at anything in terms of actual building. That's not my role. That is the university's role. My role is to say where, what I think the demand is. And I think the demand for graduate housing and medical school housing is strong and that there are the appealing locations for them include Trinity Campus and places between campus and downtown. But Trinity Campus is certainly a very appealing place. For undergraduate students, the demand for, quote, on-campus housing is not strong. And to the extent that there is demand, it is demand that has to be met through some criteria. One, very few regulations, you know, not the RA presence, not the alcohol policy, not the food service thing, and also locational, being someplace between the campus and downtown. Now, it can be closer to campus than downtown, but it can't be on Redstone campus, and it can't be, you know, at the back part of campus. It's got to be someplace that students are going to be attracted to that is convenient to their lives. And I think this is just a clarifying question. Thank you for the presentation. I apologize for being tardy. Um, the annual costs on the university side of the um, of the numbers is this a 12-month equivalent, or is no? That that's we we said at the outset. That's a nine-month cost. Got it. Yes. So if you, I mean, so the numbers look close, but I think what it, what, it, what it's missing is the reality that those other three months, those students, yeah, some some may have the benefit of going home and living with parents. Some may have the benefit of shacking up with somebody, but the vast majority, and I think you missed this in your assessment of going to school and, and partying downtown, also working. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are still a co costs associated with them this is the three months. So these numbers are, from the decision-making standpoint of students, they're all in costs for nine months, maybe the 16 or, or 17, but you're forgetting the three other months. And so from a propensity to pay and exist in the marketplace on a annual basis, those, those numbers do travel. I know that, that. That's a fair point. I, wanted to I, I would also say that students probably don't make that, cal they probably don't think ahead to summer when they're making their decisions, but that is a fair point. You're absolutely right. I think students dr drastically do think for, I mean, th they're required, I was just working with students today who are looking for housing for next year already. I mean, the market's so tight, they're thinking ahead a year or two, mm -hmm. in my experience. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to uh, thank you both for, for being here and ask that you um, um, stay tuned for a request for a more in-depth conversation uh, down the road here in, uh, in early spring. And, and uh, Lisa, when can we expect to, to have access to the, the written report? Actually, could you pass it to yeah. Um, I don't have it. I don't actually have a timeline on that right know. now. Okay. And Carol, did you have something? You can. Yes, you can have the PowerPoint. Yes. And the PowerPoint, if that could go to CEDO, um and the NPA website where everyone can have access. Sure. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Great. Thanks again. Okay. So next up, we have uh, the state representatives, um, Brian and Barbara. Where are you, folks? Can you, can you come on up? So my understanding is you're going to make some brief remarks and then look for input from the folks. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thank you. So I'm Barbara Rachelson. I represent Chittenden 66, which includes part of one and eight. And um, 
serve on the House Judiciary Committee and on judicial retention. Well, I got an electric shock from this thing. <clears throat> You're electric, Barbara. <clears throat> it's foreshadowing of the legislative session. So, um, I'm Brian Chena. I'm a state representative for Chitton in 6-4, which is most of Ward 1. I believe like one street of Ward 8. A piece of land that nobody lives, I think, in Ward 6. And then a chunk of Ward 2, which is the section I live in. And uh, I'm on the House Health Care Committee. Um, also the co-chair of the Working Vermonters Caucus. And I'm on the, the Vermont Artificial Intelligence Task Force. So what we thought, um, we certainly can talk about some of the um, issues that we will be working on in the upcoming session. But I know Brian and I both talked about having the opportunity to hear from you all about what is important to you to um, have the legislature addressing and what kinds of issues do you want to hear updates on as the session rolls along. So this is the second year of the biennium. Um, we have the bills in from last year. They're still alive and uh, many of them are sitting in committees. Um, but uh, at the end of the session, we start from um, every, all the bills die. So the deadline for um, new legislation was December 1st, but there still can be committee bills and short there are still ways to have legislation go in. So. Yeah, so I think we just want to open it up to hear your concerns, your needs, um, things you want us to fight for, um, or any questions you have. And we're happy to share what we're working on, but we wanted to start off sort of open. Um, and I guess one thing I would say is that people who don't normally have access to us, I would like to prioritize. Not that I'm going to cut people off, but I want to put that out there. Like, if you're someone who knows me and sees me all the time, or is like has power in some way, like let's just make space for people who may not have that chance. But I don't want to censor people. I'm just sort of just a reminder. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, anybody has any input? Yeah. Hello, I'm Hannah and I live in Ward 8, and I just feel like there's not a lot of outreach or communication between what's going on on the state level with students or like really anyone in the community and I feel like we have it down on like a city council level of having that open conversation but I don't ever see that really like from you um, so I'm just wondering what you're working towards to strengthen outreach. So I oh I was going to ask you where where you look where you're looking. I mean I know for me like I'm pretty tuned in to Front Porch Forum and all of that, so I'm like not a great example, but I know like most of my peers aren't, like don't have the same opportunity and aren't paying attention on that level. So do you have recommendations? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I guess, um, <clears throat> like I know that I, I post things on Facebook, on Twitter, um, sometimes on Instagram, sometimes on Twitter. I try to avoid Twitter because it's too cluttered with like nonsense, but, but, um, from porch forum, I'll post things. We go door knocking when it's time to campaign. We, I know that myself and Selena, who's my district mate, who's not here because she's at a conference right now, um, we go to MPAs like this. We go to community forums. I personally go to um, meetings, caucuses of the Progressive Party, Democratic Party. I go to Democratic Socialist of America meetings. So I, those are some of the things I do. But I'd be curious, like if we're missing you, what else should we do? You know. Anybody have any suggestions on that of, of how the state reps could be out, uh, doing more outreach? One thing that um, I know we've tried to do and have done successfully at times is um, get to the campuses and talk to various groups. So I'm also excited, it sounds like Champlain has just um, started some both Democratic and I'm not sure if they have all three party groups. Um, I've also um, thought about asking the cynic. I did a few years ago about us doing um, a legislative column and have those of us that represent part of um, UVM rotate of putting in updates there. I've reached out. I know Champlain has um, a communication. 
one of the things also that I've gotten mixed feedback about is printing up materials and leaving them at the polls or putting them in people's stores. I know some people really want us to be more paperless. So any ideas are wonderful. Um, we frequently have like times that people can come meet with us and we can certainly bring those up to campus so to make that easier for people. So other other comments? I just want to add to that yeah. that, um, that <clears throat> We do sometimes get invited to the school to do events. Um, one, th one thing that I found challenging is that we're not allowed to put political information up around the school. So like if I wanted to reach out to you, I could not come to campus and knock on your doors on campus. Not that you live on campus, but I'm saying there's a barrier. Like we're not allowed to do that. And we're not allowed to hang up flyers on campus. Although people break the rules, like I've seen some elections where there are flyers everywhere for people, but I won't do that. So. I hope UVM hears that. Like, I, I won't break your rules. Um, but um, one thing that we could potentially do is sometimes me and Selena have, like, we'll meet here at the hospital and, and, and announce it and, and meet with constituents. Perhaps if UVM allows it, we could meet it on campus sometimes and see if that might make us more accessible to students. So this is, uh, this is a, new, a new subject. Yeah. Is that okay? Um, I, I, I want to move this away from me just a little bit and uh, talk a little bit about state funding for homeless. Um, homeless funding has been level funded for the last couple of years. Um, I, I'm speaking about it uh, specifically from the standpoint of domestic violence and shelters where our general, uh, general assistance funds and housing opportunity grants are, are just not enough, and they haven't been enough, and they're just getting to be less. Is there something that you can bring to advocate for maybe changing the way AHS is allocating their funds or giving a little bit more money out? Um, so a few things. One is um, having worked in the nonprofit sector for the last, it's, it's embarrassing how long, but 35 years, um, that's something that I have been, um, very concerned about is what we do in terms of level funding year after year. The other thing that I'm concerned about that we've dealt with in House Judiciary is we fund certain um, domestic violence projects based on fees that um, perpetrators are paying and it seems like we need to move away from just seeing what kinds of fees are coming in and looking at what the needs are. Um, Treasurer Beth Pierce right now is looking at um, the various housing reports and studies that have been done and trying to come to, um, she's gonna be presenting a full report in January to the legislature. And when I talked to her yesterday, she said if people um, have concerns and they want to talk to her, that that, um, would be something that she welcomes and I'm happy to either connect you with her or um, share with her some of the concerns that have come up. Uh, it's, I know that the shortage of housing for both homeless and victims of domestic violence has been really teetering in past years. The hotel situation's gone back and forth and um, I think we just need to continue to advocate. There were some good advocates um, there, but yeah. there's, you know, sometimes uh, other needs that unfortunately have more pressure or more po sort of political capital. But um, I can tell you that I know um, Brian and I and Selena um, are really uh, particularly strong advocates for human services, especially um, basic needs. Thanks, Barb. Did, Did you want to say something? Regarding Brian? housing, as uh, people may be aware, like the state hasn't been able to use all of the housing vouchers that we were eligible for, um, partially because of a lack of apartments that people could use them in, but also because of requirements for people to have additional services to stay in the apartments. And I think that filler further illustrates the argument by why we need housing first approach, like what Pathways does, where there's low threshold, immediate access to apartments and services available to people in those apartments. And so I've been meeting with Pathways um, to work on a proposal for the Appropriations Committee around how to slowly 
shift the investment of, of housing um, towards housing first. Um, I don't have the details yet. I'm happy to talk about that once we figure that out, but I just want to throw it out there. Okay, so we have two more uh, comments or questions. Richard and then Michael. Uh, thank you. Very, thanks very much, uh, uh, Barbara and Brian, for uh, coming. Uh, I touched on this last year when when we met with you, and I, I wonder. Uh, and apropos of Barbara talking about being paperless, we're also newspaperless essentially in, in the city. And so much of what tends, tends to happen, I think, as Hannah alluded to, it seems to be in a vacuum. And then all of a sudden, we find the budget is. And this could apply to city council as well. The, the, here's the budget. Here are the taxes, and you haven't really had any input. So I'm. My question is, to what extent are you able to put together metrics that people can easily see that a 1% improvement, for instance, in the number of prisoners incarcerated out of state or students that are retained in the state and that you could come up with a couple of dozen, to, to what extent can you publish such uh, metrics and have that drive policy and drive the budget instead of seemingly the other way around. Um, any company would do that, and I don't understand why our public entities don't. So I appreciate your comments, and I've got other ideas. But So last week we had a um, fiscal briefing, which the legislature gets every year. It's done by the Joint Fiscal Office. and. Um, not only do they give us metrics, which again, we can, we can send this, the link to this around, it's on the website, but they also do a fiscal facts um, booklet every year. And you're right, like it's important to have that information. There are people sitting in prison right now because they either don't have housing or they were furlough violators, but they were out in the community and sent back to prison for something that was not against the law, but was against their furlough conditions. And that's a small fortune that we're paying. Um, we also have a lot of people housed that really need mental health and substance abuse treatment and are not receiving it. So it's, it's also trying to redeploy money that's being spent now um, more sensibly. If any of you read Digger last week, it's maddening to hear that DMV sold um, our personal information and over the past three years collected about $14 million in, um, in revenues for doing that. And it's like, where is that money? Is that just like they get to keep that because they didn't report it? That could go to a lot of um, funding to make sure people have a safe, warm place to live. So, so uh, I just want to remind people that everything that we do is public um, in terms of our committee work and e and and d debate on the floor of the house. That whenever we are in session and we're convening, you can listen over VPR. There's an app you can put on your phone. You can do it through the computer. You can listen to the debate. Um, you can hear the roll calls. Um, Every day a journal is published and a calendar. The calendar is for the current day. The journal is for the day before. There's a record of all of that going back like 10 years or something online that you can go through. Um, in every, every committee meeting, all of the witnesses information they submit is posted online. It's sorted through our website by committee, but you can also look things up by bill or by legislator. Um, and so I just put that out there because there, there is an overwhelming amount of information out there. Um, I want you to know how to access it, but I will say that if anyone has a specific question, it's okay to email us and ask. And it might take a little time, but we can take a few minutes to go through that and direct you to the right place. And the worst case scenario, which I've done, is I can't find something and I write to the Legislative Council office and I and join Fiscal Office and I say, constituent wants to know this. And they usually tell us pretty quickly because it's usually there somewhere and we just haven't found it. So I just want to let you know I, that I can understand how it can be frustrating. Um, when you want to know something and it's not easy to find, so just feel free to ask. And if there's, if people feel like you'd want like a report card, like you're like, here's 10 statistics that the MPA wants to know, maybe we could put something together for you, like around, along that, if that's what you were referring to. But. So my question really was how it drives, how it drives policy, but I'll, I'll move on to get other people more time. 
So we have uh, three other people that, that have questions or comments, and we also have a, a lot more to cover tonight, so I'd ask that you be as succinct as you can be. So it's Michael, and then Adam, and Patricia, and then we're gonna move on to the DPW conversation. Okay, go ahead. Okay. I just want to get your response to uh, what's been, it's been in the news lately, uh, some disturbing uh, stories about the Chittenden Regional uh, Correctional Center, and uh, I'm not sure exactly what role the legislature may play in addressing some of those issues, but uh, they need to uh, be, be addressed. So, <clears throat> hello, hello, hello. Is it okay now? I'm so sensitive to like feedback, I'm afraid now I'm gonna set it off. All right, so, um, so the, the uh, Women's Legislative Caucus, which I am a member of, you are too, right? Yeah. So, and so with Selena, um, that we have been, this has been the main, like the um, corrections reform, specifically in the women's facility, has been our priority over the last year, so our, our caucus has been doing work where we're bringing in former inmates and um, staff and starting to hear a little bit about what was going on and asking lots of questions. And over the summer, we were able to like work with the Commissioner of Corrections to start exploring new models. Um, specifically, one model I was advocating for is called the Norway model. And you can, if you Google Norway model, it comes up. It's the approach to use in Norway where we, we, would, we treat a prisoner as a neighbor not as someone were to punish. The idea is like, this is gonna be your neighbor, how are you gonna treat them? And they have um, like the statistics of the amount they invest and how much it costs and the, and the re reduction in recidivism shows that it works. And there's, a, there's a, um, an organization in the United States helping North Dakota and a few other states do this work. And so over the summer, I spoke with the Commissioner of Corrections and he agreed to start speaking with North Dakota. And up until this all came out, what we were hearing was he's looking at completely retraining the staff and completely changing the culture of prisons. And then all this came out. And so now we, you know, the Women's Caucus wrote a statement which is Digger has put out, but I'm happy to share that with you if anyone wants to read it expressing our position, um, and I can guarantee you that not only that caucus, but many of us are, you know, as individuals are gonna be going back in, um, asking questions, demanding accountability, and continuing to fight for reform, and it, it just shows you that, like, there's, the problem was deeper than we even knew, you know? The one other piece is that what's going on in the prison is horrendous and really needs to be stopped immediately. It's, it's, so awful, I'm embarrassed to be associated with state government when that kind of things are happening. But we also have to look at the um, biases in women being sentenced in the first place. Women are sent for longer sentences for lesser crimes and um, there are many other alternatives. If we put a price tag on what the cost is to send a prisoner to any of the correctional facilities for a year and what the recidivism rate is, people would be more up in arms than they are about property taxes because we are spending so much money for something that isn't working. And so it's, and then you find out that it's doing harm, um, it's just outrageous. So Adam and Patricia, and I'd ask you both to, to be uh, clear and to the point so we can, 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 can get to the department uh, presentation, but also you can make your points. So Adam, go ahead. I'll let Patricia go first, and if I can sneak in at the end, that's okay, but if not, I can follow up because sure. of what you said. Patricia, could you have a microphone? Yeah, my question expresses my <coughs> ignorance, which is how do you all decide what you're gonna work on in a year? And is there a place where I can go and find out where that list is? You know, where's, where's your list of your to-dos or issues or whatever? Thank you. Okay, so. Do you have a short answer? I'll try to be short. Um, so if you clicked on either of us, our legislator uh, name on the website, it would come up with every bill that we've introduced or are a co-sponsor co of. Um, Again, a lot of us are trying to get that information out via social media as well. Um, some of the local news, Digger is at the State House a lot, seven days was covering political stuff. The other piece is we might want to work on something very badly and a lot of it depends on um, the, if the committee that it's assigned to is going to take it up. 
Yeah. I, I never thought about the idea of having like my list of priorities really clearly posted somewhere because I don't have, the website I created I used during campaigning and then like don't touch it, you know? Um, so that's an interesting idea that I'll think about how to do, do that. But it is, when we introduce an idea, it is documented, like our bills are documented. And so usually the way I was thinking of it is when I introduce a bill, then you see it. But I think that's different than having a clear list of like, this is what I'd like to do, which I think both of us have really, and Selena have really long lists. So we, we're working on like something in every area. Um, so I'll work, I will work over the next week or two to do that. And I think we, we are allowed to post something like that. It feels a little weird to use Front Porch Forum to be like, these are my priorities, but at the same time, maybe I'll say someone asked, and so I'm gonna use it for this purpose. I see a face. I feel like that's, that's taking up space, but maybe it's space we should be taking. So I, I hear that feedback, um, and I'm happy to talk today about it if you want the info sooner, but I'll try to post something by the new year. So you all take your issues, you present them to committee, and then is it a majority rule? Um, uh, it it's not addressed? that simple. It's actually really complicated. I think what happens is the we, committees. We don't even have time for that. I don't oh. think. Right? Yeah, because yeah. so okay. I won't give a complicated answer. Okay. I'm just going to say the committees have their discussion, but then the leadership has its discussion, okay. and then outside of that, it's a big game of how you can switch people's minds. Okay. I think that's a simple answer. So, <laughs> Thank you. Adam, Thank you. which works sometimes. <laughs> Um, I, I can go pretty quick. I just want to do a follow-on and return back to the, the homelessness issue because we talked about, you know, obviously talking about housing is important. We're talking about homelessness, but really no one chooses to, you know, not many people choose to be homeless It's a byproduct of the mental health and substance abuse issues. Barbara, you mentioned that. Uh, I was going to ask, you know, what, what could y'all do to help support us at the local level who are really de dealing with this on a day-to-day on a -day? Uh, basis and instead of doing that, maybe I'll just suggest three or four things that have been coming up over and over that maybe the state could be supportive of. Um, expanding the street outreach team uh, that Howard Center has been so great at, at running over these years, but they're down from six team members to four. Uh, it costs about $80,000 all in salary plus benefits to staff one of those positions. And I've been trying for a few years to find a sustainable. 16 to four? From six to four. Oh, okay. okay. Six to four. Um, yeah, so I've been trying to find a sustainable funding stream for, for a few years to get that number back up, if not grow up beyond six, but that's one way. Um, expanding, uh, expanding the mental health and opioid uh, treatment while incarcerated, especially uh, the medical, medical assisted treatment program within the prison system. We see a lot of people coming out and a lot of times want to get back in for treatment, but when treatment's up, they, they, they fall back. Um, furthering support for the low barrier shelter, which we have. Um, thank you so much for the 360 or 80 thousand dollars that come each year. But we're still every year looking for donations for a whole host of things, uh, including food. Um, and I will. I'll stop. No, I won't stop there. I think also we have a real need for low, super low barrier employment opportunities for folks who are on the way towards recovery but haven't quite gotten. <laughs> Their, themselves together to fill out paperwork and, and go through that. So support around low barrier employment, which we are pursuing at the city level, would be really helpful. Be briefly, um, Adam, those are great issues, and um, thank you for your commitment to them. So some of us have worked on um, a homeless bill of rights, which I don't know what happened with that. But anyway, um, what I want to say is the, the Medicaid state um, plan just got approved. So I think there's some potential in there that we all need to look at. The correctional system in Vermont, I just want to say that no matter how long your sentence is, you could have a 10-year sentence, a two-year sentence, you only really get most of the treatment and services for your last six months, which is bizarre. No other state does that. And our health care in prison, we're the second most expensive state in the nation. We currently contract with Centurion, which is a for-profit health care company out of Florida, which other states have sued. And if you look at, the, I have a great Pew report that shows that other states, including Connecticut, if you take the prisoners out of the prison and bring them like to the med school, you can use federal funds rather than general funds. It would be a way to also fund Vermont um, institutions rather than a for-profit company in Florida. So um, I know that's one of the things that I've been trying to get headway on. Oh, 
I'm not going to say anything. I was trying to find out the status of the homeless bill, right? Okay. I'll so I'm going to thank you all and, and uh, ask that uh, you consider returning in a few months' time. We'll, we, we can be in touch because there's obviously a longer conversation here with just a lot of interest in talking with you all. So thank you for coming and uh, hope to see you again soon. And th thanks very much. And thanks for your service. Uh, next up is uh, folks from the D uh, Department of Public Works. As many of you know, that we, we've had several conversations. Uh, one is about uh, safety um, along East Avenue, and the other is uh, s sidewalk uh, safety uh, throughout the city, uh, particularly in wards one and eight, uh, areas where there's uh, 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 spots where there's uh, trip hazards, ice, icing, ponding, those kinds of things make it uh, difficulty with uh, for wheelchair access on sidewalks. So we're going to spend a few minutes on each of those. So we're going to start with uh, with uh, Chapin and company uh, talking about uh, the East Avenue safety, have a few questions, and then uh, a short bit uh, update on what is happening uh, with DPW in terms of addressing those uh, safety ha hazards on sidewalks. So over to you guys. Great, thank you very much, Cindy. Uh, Chapin Spencer, Director of Public Works. With me, City Engineer Norm Baldwin, Senior Transportation Planner Nicole Loesch, and Senior Engineer Laura Wheelock. Uh, Laura was just handing out uh, a bunch of information because last time we presented, there was a request to uh, present in a more abbreviated fashion and to have more conversation. So uh, we have, as requested uh, by the NPA Steering Committee, provided a list of draft sidewalk projects for the coming year, as well as an update on the East Ave. And we also have some exciting news of the construction season not quite done yet, uh, and something we are going to install tomorrow in Ward 1. So with that, I'm going to start off with uh, Nicole, who's going to give an update on East Avenue traffic calming. Thanks, Javen. I was asked to give a 30-second overview here, so I'm going to make this really quick so we have lots of time for questions. Um, quick summary, our traffic calming program was established in the late 90s. It hasn't been updated since the early 2000s, so we are in the midst of trying to update this program. Um, the most significant changes that you may expect there, uh, hopefully the main goal is to streamline this program for the community and for staff. We know that this is not currently working well for the community or the department. So we're changing everything from the intake process to the neighborhood meeting process to the, the final outcomes. Um, so we have in the handout a little summary of what we're trying to change and the proposed schedule related to that. So we're hiring a consultant right now to help us develop some thresholds that will really separate traffic calming from neighborhood enhancements. And that will allow us to prioritize the streets that do have a measurable problem with traffic and safety. And with that, we'll then initiate some new projects in 2020. And with the data that we have so far, it is likely that East Avenue will be on that list. Um, but this is a kind of early in that process. We don't have those defined thresholds yet, but that is the first deliverable that we're asking for from our consultants. So that's a very quick overview of where we are with that program. Um, Chief, I don't know if you want to take questions now or give an overview of everything and take questions at the end. Let's just do a quick overview of everything and then we'll open it up. So Norm Baldwin, uh, the city engineer, I'm also uh, deeply involved in some of the transportation review of these types of issues, particularly of uh, interest to this group is the, of course, the East Ave crosswalk, East Ave and Bildu crosswalk. Um, so I'm, a, I'm not sure if people are aware, but we go through some gen general standards of practice and guidelines that relate to how we install crosswalks and the, the methods of, or different variations of crosswalks that, that are installed in relation to the volume of traffic and also volume of pedestrians and how those challenges exist and how we can try to address and enhance safety. So for crosswalks, we typically either have a crosswalk that's marked with striping and also advanced warning sign package and is lit. For more enhanced crosswalks, we have what you're familiar with is the RRFB, the Rectangular flash Flashing Beacon. Um, the city for the longest time had standards that related to what the state of Vermont had listed for guidelines and recommendations for crosswalks. We were following that and then we built an overlay to that which didn't look exclusively at volumes of traffic but looked at number of pedestrians and also volumes of traffic and gave consideration to both to lower the potential threshold of competing volume of traffic itself. So 
applying those standards to the evaluation of the East Ave crosswalk as it exists today with the information we have available today, we're saying it doesn't meet the warrants or guidelines for RFB. I understand that doesn't make some people happy, but it's important that people understand that we are protective of those guidelines because it's important that these don't get pervasively placed throughout the city and then become diminished in its value. We are going to commit to the community here that we'll be doing additional work to gather more information in terms of volume of traffic since the data we have is somewhat dated. We also want to look cl more closely at the volume of pedestrians crossing there. So that's the kind of general overview of that circumstance. I would add that we have looked very closely at the existing condition after the accident. That's our standard practice when an accident occurs. We look at is the sign package in place? How is the uh, sight lines? Can people be seen from a distance that is appropriate for people to slow down or stop? And we look at overhead illumination. We work very closely with BED on the illumination and checking the standards and we've asked them post this accident to check and see what those light levels were. And in fact, they were adequate and consistent with the IES standards as noted in the memo that we provided. Independent of that simple fact, we also asked them to boost the light levels to improve visibility. We believe that there was some things that couldn't be understood as to why this accident occurred and the only thing we could assume was that there was some reflectivity off the street given it was a rainy, dark condition. That aside, I think we're, tr we're trying to do some interim steps that make it somewhat safer than uh, as, as we know that an accident did occur. In addition, we're also going to be looking at what is the history of this crosswalk. Is there incidents that have occurred previously that we are not aware of? So we've asked the police department to provide us accident reports for the last five years. Those accident reports have been, we've been given generalized accident reports, we've not been given the specifics of the accidents that occur there, whether it be a car, car to car or with injuries or car with a pedestrian with injuries. Those are all relevant to us deciding and determining what is correctable circumstance. Um, beyond that, of course, there are other locations of interest to the community. And so on a more positive note, we are installing a rapid flashing beacon, beacon at Colchester and Chase. And the installation is actually going in tomorrow morning at, starting at 8 o'clock. So be advised that is happening. And um, I think I'll stop there and let others speak to the next balance of issues. Okay. So uh, are you, do you have more? Uh, we were going to do the sidewalk piece and then open it for okay. questions. Okay. Uh, so also included in your packet is the tentative work plan, um, just highlighting Ward 1, Ward 8 sidewalk work uh, for the calendar year 2020. Um, do put a giant disclaimer that you know this is using our tentative budget, that the budget process has not um, commenced with the city for approval yet, but this is our tentative targeted work plan, looking to put about $1.7 million worth of infrastructure work in this summer. Um, looking at the short long run tallies, you know, you're about one third, two thirds short run to long runs. Um, this will also address about 31% of our C click fixes that we've addressed or uh, inspected to be in a high to medium condition for targeting for work. Um, Noting that our full list of proposed work is going to go into the DPW Commission packet. That meeting is next Wednesday, 6.30 at DPW on Pine Street. Um, other meetings of note, the Mansfield Ave side path has a meeting coming up next Tuesday, December 17th, 6 p.m. in this room here. Um, and there's also a meeting for University Heights that happens tomorrow at 5.30 in the Davis Center. Uh, this is just to introduce the intersection study work that we are doing and uh, explore some concepts with the primary user group uh, for that intersection. If you have any questions, uh, please reach out to DPW. We do have names and phone number contacts on this memo. Um, for the University Heights, which isn't listed here, that is the Madeline or Maddie Sender, which is listed under many of these options. Okay, so we open it up to questions and comments. Anybody have one? Yeah, Jonathan. 
this is just quick. This is about the sidewalks, of course. Um, I'll save the other stuff for a rant later. That's okay. <laughs> um, the the 1.7 million dollars includes the uh, what's left of the extra half million dollars that was allocated this year, right? Correct. Right. And what is the how does this uh, one the uh, six thousand to twelve thousand compare to last year, the year before? You know, just what's it look like? It looks like your long run numbers are lower than the three miles you typically do, but but can you just give a sense of how this how, what the what the change is from previous years? So this ends up being just slightly larger than the three miles that we do target, uh, thanks in part to the additional funding that comes from the city council in the fiscal year 20 approval. Okay, in terms of short runs, and the short runs are a significant. The short runs are a significant increase over what we have done in previous years. This was in part due to uh, direction we've been hearing from the public and the Ward 1 8 NPA. Uh, this uh, 6,000 linear feet represents, while it may seem shorter in distance in the long runs, it is an incredible number of short fixes from 1 to 3 to 10 panels. And so you'll see Ward 1 and 8 here will be showing the entire cities. Uh, proposed 2020 work plan, as Laura said, at the upcoming commission meeting. So what was short runs last year, just for a number, just this way? Oh. Like a couple thousand or four thousand? Or we didn't track the data that way, so it, it um, it's not really available. Much less. Okay. So hang, hang on, Karen, we got, um, let's see, Sharon, Richard, and then, then you. Go ahead. Okay, so um, this year there were like half a million dollars put in for the short runs that was additional dollars for you um, because I'm on the Board of Finance and I told you Ward 1 and 8 made a difference and I made sure that was in the budget. I don't know what was there before but it was an additional five half a million dollars for short runs. Um, I wanted to say a couple of things. One is you know I gave Norm the evil eyeball when he said that East Avenue didn't um, qualify for a flashing pedestrian crossing, but that was only because I know Norm. I appreciate the work, and um, I think that the intensity of the light and the fact that Parks and Rec cleared some of the, where the landing is has is a big improvement. I'm not saying that's the solution, but it's a big improvement. I noticed that immediately, and so I want to just acknowledge that because I believe, I told you before, that the pedestrian was part of the bank, invisible to the, to the driver until they stepped into the road. So I hope this helps because we don't want any more accidents there. Um, and as far as East Avenue um, sidewalks, I was looking. Um, I really can't speak to, I'm, I'm appreciative that, um, that that was done also because of the focus on East Avenue and because one of the people that I think lives in co-housing who is in a wheelchair mentioned that she had to navigate to get anywhere on the street because the sidewalk was in such disrepair. So on her behalf, I think I'll, I'll thank you, hoping that it really does address the issues that she brought forward. Um, and then there was one other thing I wanted to say um, in regards to this. Um, so I'm going to speak for Jarrett Wood, who everybody knows, who um, has called me and called Adam and probably a number of other people in the room. Um, he made this comment, which is very true. Um, I've seen people not stop for the flashing pedestrian, yellow flashing light for pedestrians. And yellow does not mean stop, it means to be cautious. And he wondered, and I'm just going to get this on the record, he wondered if we're serious about making it safe, why it wasn't a flashing red, and why we weren't really taking that to another level. And I couldn't respond to him. Um, but and I'm, I, I just wanted to get that out there on his behalf because he thinks that we set people up potentially to put them in harm's way. Um, and the last thing is I know Jarrett would support anything we can do to make navigating around our community easier for those people who um, have, um, who are have a disability or ha are challenged or just b basically want to walk as opposed to bike or use a car. Thank you. you have a, uh, very short, uh, 
I think I think it needs to people need to understand that a crosswalk is a warning device. The rapid flashing beacon in the beacon is a warning device. The next level of of control is signalization and uh, typically a hawk in a mid block, but that would be for different circumstances typically, but you could potentially do that, but it's it's costly. And is that really the best fit given the given the volume of activity? May I just one just saying? May I just ask that potentially that that DPW really um, educate the community about the flashing yellow and the request about flashing red and whether or not that is something that could be considered or not? Because I think I I've heard this from other people, not just Jared. When I came to the last DPW meeting, the last time when I was sitting in the audience, there was a conversation about it. Thank you. Great. The, the city standards and the state standards do reference uh, appropriate standards for uh, a hawk signal. Hawk signal is an all stop for the pedestrian crossing. Uh, and <coughs> we do take a look at that and use technical guidance to, to guide us uh, for those decisions. We'll keep looking at them, yes. Thank you. But that's not it. Uh, I've got a question. No. I have a question okay. for Norm. Uh, apologies, Norm, if I if I missed this. But in your criteria for um, the RRFBs, um, do you include police data? We're we're using data as part of our analysis. Yes. Is it prescribed so in the guidelines? No. So what data do you get from the BPD? Well, what we look from the police department is really. Um, over a period of time, what type of accidents occur? No, I'm what, not talking about accidents. I'm well, talking about incidents. Well, accidents, incidents, things that are reportable. We have other, no other means well, beyond reportable. So, so my supplementary, if you will, is that um, the Burlington Police Department are averse to traffic enforcement. They know that East Avenue is a racetrack because of, because of various sharp details that have been run there, and it's documented. Like Shapen has the has the has the data, uh, but do you speak? How can how can you speak about safety on a street that is not patrolled by the police when you're depending on the police for your information? I just do not understand it, and no. it's a it's a problem. You know it's a you know it's a problem. Okay, so the the police reports, the accident or incident reports, are just one piece of the puzzle in terms of re the review, and there is some engineering judgment that has to be applied here, and we can't go by simple formulas to make these decisions, but we also know and understand that we can't install er these devices in every condition and every circumstance and have it be useful, and so we have to be prudent about how we use these devices. So that On people the other hand, pay attention. You, know, you know that if someone ran a sharp detail, um, just yep. just as a, as a one-off, and picked up seventeen hundred dollars worth of fines in five hours, you yep. know that that is indica well, indicative of of uh, poor driving standards and poor com compliance to the rules. Well, I would say that there's really we've talked about this many times. There's three components to trying to improve safety. One of them is police enforcement and enforcement action. The other is education appealing to people's nature to do what's right and necessary and appropriate. And, uh, and the other pieces are engineering, our, our work to make systems better so that people are well aware of what's ahead and what should be expected. So that's our goal, is to have all three work together and really solve these problems the best we can. It's not to say we can get rid of all problems, but that is our goal. We have personally reached out requesting additional enforcement on a number of hot spots in Ward 1 and 8, including East Avenue. And the response is? Oh, you've reached out, but you haven't got a response. Well, I think we're, we're getting response from the police in a, in a more positive direction than we have in the past. Yeah. So we can't, we can't say that they're deeply committed to all this. We, don't, we can't say that they're not committed at all, but we see movement and we see support. John Murad is really been a good partner in this process, particularly for this East Ave Billadu review. He has been spot on getting us information before the formal police report comes out on this accident. So to him, I give him credit. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I know one of my big problems is the trippers or toe stoppers. 
whatever you want to call them in the because not yeah. only do we have a neighbor up, up on East Avenue who came and spoke to you about going on the side you know in the street with their wheelchair our neighbor just had back surgery and she asked me to help her walk up and down the street and we walked in the street I said well, why can't we walk on the sidewalk she says oh it's too bumpy <laughs> So, I mean, that is a big problem, and I'm not yeah. sure. I know it's more cost-effective to do, like, whole long streets, but until we get, like, the really bad things done, I think we should focus on that and then go ahead and, you know, do over everything. But my other thing, and I'm not sure what's happening with the quick build, but I know people have said this to you before, but as a bicyclist, being put out in front of cars as a traffic calming measure is really uncomfortable. And I'm talking about coming from City Market on Union Street, turning right on Loomis. You've got the bolsters so that you are really pushed out in the street. So anybody coming down Loomis to turn right on Union Street, they're there right at you because there's just, it's a narrow area. But then when you're on Loomis because of the bolsters along, you know, there's parked cars on one side, which is where you're riding, and then there's those bump out bolster things on the other side. So if a car is coming down Loomis and a bicyclist is coming up Loomis, that car veers and they're head on going to you. It's really, really frightening. And I know different people have said this to you that as a bicyclist, I feel like I'm being put in harm's way for traffic calming measures. Um, and I don't really quite understand. You are really creating a one-way area where you have a parked car, one lane of traffic, and then the bolsters. So it's not safe for people. And it doesn't really slow the cars down. I mean, unless there's another car coming, they will go as fast as they want. It's another car, it's a car on car situation. They will stop and slow down. But if it's a bicyclist and a car, you really are putting us out there. And I hope I'm not the person in a wheelchair or a walker because I get hit next time I'm coming back from City Market. Thank you. Oh, sorry. So, so um, I'm gonna step out of the social <coughs> and ask you, uh, DPW, to respond to the uh, uh, petition and the resolution, the resolution that this group made asking you to address the safety issues on East Avenue and uh, the, the petition included a number of things besides the rapid flasher, and we'd really like to, to get your response to those other me measures to slow traffic down, because it, as Richard said, it's a racetrack. People are flying through there particularly between 5.30 and 7.30 in the morning. They're going 40 plus miles an hour. They don't stop for pedestrians. It's, more, more light helps, but it's not gonna keep us safe. So if you just want that, I'd appreciate it. Do you want Oh, you want to I'll start out by saying there's a multitude of efforts underway and Nicole uh, is managing and overseeing a East Ave and Colchester Ave scoping project that's underway. The traffic calming you heard that we're redoing the traffic calming program to prioritize safety concerns and we believe that uh, once we do the additional data collection that East Avenue will rise to the top of that one. And so it's uh, all detailed here in the memo. Uh, we are hoping to have the uh, consultant developing uh, the new draft program this spring and then in July 2020, starting with the new set of streets that are uh, that meet that safety threshold. And you identify the streets in uh, this company in 2020 and then start the studies probably in 2021? In July of 2020. Okay. So just this year. Well, right. we're, right. we're looking to move this quickly because we have 11 requests in queue. We're hearing a number of communities anxious, as I know you all are as well. And I will say we've done the vegetation clearing with parks. We've done the additional lighting with BED. Uh, we are going to continue to be bullish. We're putting the new RRFB on at Chase Lane tomorrow. Uh, we've got a new side path getting going in on Colchester Ave next year. This part of Burlington is getting uh, as much improvement, if not more, than many other areas in the city. And we're pleased to reinvest in this part of town. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your work. Yep. And uh, uh, the, the city councilors are going to give some new stuff. We understand if you need to go, we understand if you need to go. Just pop in for two seconds. Okay. Uh, Jason, just pop in on the hel
yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, Jason, you have some stuff. Jason, you, you want to do a quick update on uh, the helicopters? Is that right? Thanks, it's tossed. No batteries in there. Okay. I'll use that one. I was hoping to go last so we could end on a high note, because I'm here to talk about helicopters. Everybody wake up. All right. So I am passing around an updated map. This was shared um, with some folks um, who are interested in the issue of helicopters uh, flying critically ill patients to the UVM Medical Center and landing at the helipad by the jug handle. I presented on this before uh, and received some really helpful feedback on the map and we have refined it based on lived experience. So uh, a couple of two sort of boundary highlights and then one very important highlight um, in relation to the map that uh, we have recently discovered. So uh, the, the boundary changes were made um, in the, the shape, the pentagon, I guess that is, up, uh, on the top of the page, where we expanded, we, we um, shifted the western boundary further west to be over the, um, the campus area. It actually is now over the UVM Medical Center and UVM campus. And we shifted the two boundaries on the east to be further over the Centennial Woods. We had a request to expand over the entirety of Centennial Woods. We are not able to make that change because of the flight path to the airport. Um, we cannot fully restrict um, uh, all the way to essentially what would be the highway um, and Grove Street because of um, access to the airport. The most, I think, important thing that we did with this map was eliminate, um, you can see the outline of the box, we eliminated all the text in that box, uh, that had a height restriction. Previously we had asked if, if helicopters are flying over the areas in the red boxes that they fly above 500 feet. We received a few um, concerns from neighbors about hearing helicopters and we learned that they were actually the service that is a collaboration between UVM Health Network and Dartmouth. Um, we examined their flight path and found that they were flying over those areas above 500 feet and learned that 500 feet is not a very meaningful threshold. And so what we are asking pilots who are flying patients to UVM Medical Center to do is to completely avoid the areas in red. Um, there is no uh, height threshold that precludes noise from impacting people who live in that area. Um, so we are continuing to monitor um, every time we get um, an, an issue raised uh, and every time I come here more people learn of me in my email address. Um, we follow up with the, the operators um, and we are looking into a few other things that have been requested by neighbors including uh, a webcam um, and uh, ultimately whether or not this helipad can move uh, onto the campus. Um, that is a very long term and very unknown, um, unanswerable question at the moment, but it is something that is on our mass facility planning radar and we need to bring the right people here um, who have done that elsewhere uh, to really examine that thoughtfully. Thank you, Jason. I, I'm Welcome. one of the people who used to get buzzed, and it's you've, it's made a world of difference. I I've, I haven't encountered a, a helicopter right over my my roof for a long time, and I appreciate your efforts in making that so. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. And we're gonna. Um, uh, I also offered that. I think it's better to try and limit our uh, amendments to this map to an annual exercise because it becomes version control. Um, nobody's quite sure which map is the right map. Um, and I think we should do that in the May or June time frame when windows start being opened up more and people are experiencing more outside noises. And so um, you have my commitment that we will have that conversation in May with anybody who's interested in it to, to see is this map still working for us. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. So over to the city councilors. We're going to um, let us know what's happening at the city council. Sharon, go ahead. I'm going to start. So I'm just going to talk about the, uh, the joint committee that Adam and I serve on. We're part of the ordinance committee that's meeting with planning. Uh, 
the Planning Commission, and we were given um, from the Housing Summit all of the issues that were ordinance related or policy related that would lead to an ordinance were, were punted to this joint committee. And so the things on, on the plate of this committee was um, accessory dwelling units, short-term rental, parking, minimum parking standards. So I have... Is that you? Um, I don't have a clue. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyways, so one thing I want to tell you is that um, last night we met and it was a public hearing on accessory dwelling units and it is being referred to the City Council and um, for those who weren't there or haven't been following this, um, there have been some modifications. Um, most of them have been to remove barriers, um, but in essence, it's going to be owner-occupied. That's going to be part of the criteria. And they've changed the size of the accessory dwelling unit to be the, what's recommended is 800 square feet or 30% uh, of the size of the primary uh, structure, principal structure, and um, whichever one of those is larger. So that's the, the maximum that you can build. And I'll leave it at that for accessory dwelling units. There's more detail, but I think that gives you the essence. Um, the second thing, the short term, did you want to say anything about that? Nope. No, I'm nope. cracking my hands. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, the second, the second item is the short-term rental. We have not taken that up, and actually the next meeting of this joint committee is not until the new year. It's going to be January 14th. But the item that is in discussion is minimum parking standards, and there has been a draft of that, and the proposal is to eliminate minimum parking requirements for development in certain areas. There's um, the mixed-use area, there's the down downtown um, and then there's a corridors there are corridors around um, so there are neighborhood activity centers but there are corridors there's the Riverside corridor which is in our ward and also Colchester Avenue those corridors there are specific requirements and I'm getting into the weeds but it's 200 feet back from the center line that would would um, be any property that meets that criteria would be able to not have to provide parking. The minimum parking standard would be eliminated. So stay tuned. If you're interested in this, please come and voice your opinion. Um, I think the hope of that joint committee is to finish that work up um, at the next meeting, which I said was January 14th. Um, so just to piggyback off of that, it's hard to talk about these things real briefly because there's a lot going on there. But um, within, even though I'm not on that joint committee, I've been pretty involved in attending those meetings and, and advocating. And um, with the elimination of the minimum parking requirements, one of the things that um, myself and others have pushed for that now is um, very firmly part of the policy discussion is um, transportation demand management requirements. So like how UVM and the medical center, they take initiative in terms of helping uh, their employees and, and students be able to get to and from campus without a car by giving things like free transit or discounted car share, discounted bike share. Um, things to help shift that behavior and that tr transportation pattern. We're going to now presuming things move forward um, on this, we would require that of uh, many new developments. So even though they don't need to require a minimum amount of parking, they will have to still deal with their transportation impacts, um, but focusing on more sustainable transportation. So I'm pretty excited about that. A um, Couple other things that I'm working on around transportation. Um, I've been talking a lot with uh, the mayor's office about trying to expand fare-free transit. We Right now we have one bus line, which was the College Street Shuttle. Now it's the Purple Line, I believe, and that's the one fare-free route, but trying to look beyond that and see if we can make any other routes in the city fare-free. So uh, that's, that's a conversation that um, I'm hoping to, to move along. Um, and, and with the hope of getting 
some expansion um, in terms of next budget year, which we'll, we'll do the budget in June. Um, and then another thing that I have been working a lot on recently is ranked choice voting or instant runoff voting, which we had in Burlington from 2005 to 2010. Um, and the city council passed a resolution uh, 9 to 3 to send this to the charter change committee that would look at, because this would be a charter change. Um, so this is something that ultimately, if it does pass through that committee and back to the council, it would then go to the voters. Um, so it, it looks like it has missed the deadline for being on the ballot for March, but if it continues to move along, it could potentially be on the ballot for November. So stay tuned on that. 9.13, we'll be out of here by 9.15, I promise. Um, uh, two quick things, I wanna give an update on the special committee on uh, policing policies, or reviewing policing policies, rather, <coughs> uh, that was put together over the late summer, early fall. Uh, they have been meeting regularly. The, the timeline that we afforded them on the first time we est when we established them, uh, they required more time, so they came back uh, late la middle late last month and asked for more time. We extended their, their work timeline and also prioritized their work to focus on uh, issues of uh, um, uh, use of force policy as well as civilian oversight models and to come back to us no later than our you got this, Adam. Uh, February 10th, sorry, it was in there. Um, and then the other update that I'll do, uh, another charter change uh, that did make it, uh, or made it out of committee uh, earlier this week was the um, all resident voting, uh, uh, thank you, uh, all resident voting uh, charter change that, I've, that I put forward, uh, I think two and a half months ago now. At this point, this, this looks at uh, expanding voting rights to folks who are legal residents of Burlington but have yet to receive legal citizenship status, the opportunity to vote in local elections, not state, not federal, but local. Um, and that's a, that's a super complex issue, much like RV, much like all charter changes are, um, but one that I think is, is time to have this conversation again uh, with the voters, and I look forward to advocating uh, for it, and I'm hoping that it will get through the city council on the, the 16th and then go to the, the ballot. 614. Have a good night, everyone. All right. <laughs> uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. And uh, uh, we'll post the presentations on the uh, and the handouts on the website, the NPA website. And uh, I'll be thinking if you want to be the rep for the uh, community development block, block grant, we'll be looking at that in January. And thanks, everyone. <laughs>